Hello. And hello. And welcome to this session on countering weapons of mass destruction with Andy Weber. My name is Kit Harris, and I'll be your MC for this session. We'll start with a 20-minute talk by Andy, followed by a fireside chat, and then we'll open up for Q&A. If you have questions, please submit them on the Swapcard app and upvote your favorites. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Andy Weber. Andy is a senior fellow at the Council on Strategic Risks and an advisor to DARPA, Ginkgo Bioworks, and others. He served as President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defense for nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs. Andy has played a key role in the destruction of chemical weapons stockpiles in Syria and Libya, and the removal of nuclear-capable aircraft from Moldova, and weapons-grade uranium from Kazakhstan and Georgia. Please give a warm welcome to Andy. Thanks, Kit. American Embassy Almaty, for diplomats who find Paris a bore. <clears throat> that was the headline on a Wall Street Journal article I was reading flying back from Germany <clears throat> to Washington for consultations in February of 1992. And it was an article about the raising of the flag at the brand new US Embassy in Kazakhstan, which had just weeks before gained independence. It was on the 26th floor of the Hotel Kazakhstan, and it described a country with a heritage going back to Genghis Khan and the, a rich culture and the fact that they still had 1,200 nuclear weapons on their territory when the Soviet Union broke up. And I had been working on uh, countering Libya's weapons of mass destruction program during my assignment in Germany. So the article really interested me. I realized this was an opportunity to, to, to get involved in, in really important uh, changes in the world. So the next day in Washington, I went to talk to my career counselor. And I said, can I volunteer to go to Kazakhstan? It sounds really interesting. I think it would be great. And he was so happy that that he found somebody with a pulse who was willing to go. Um, and so I, I got assigned to Kazakhstan. I spent uh, a full year in intensive Russian language training in the United States. And then in the summer of 1993, I arrived in, in beautiful Almaty in the Tian Shan Mountains, the heavenly mountains on the border with China and Kyrgyzstan. And not long after I arrived, my automobile mechanic fixer driver Slava asked me, would you like to buy some uranium? And it was a crazy time. Uh, after the Soviet Union had fallen apart, there was a, a loss of control, a lot of chaos, economic dislocation. And so I said, well, I'd be interested to learn more. And he said, OK. Uh, there were a lot of scams going on at the time, too, so I was pretty, pretty cautious. A couple weeks later, I'm working at the US Embassy, and I, I, somebody tells me that someone's waiting outside for me. I go outside. It's Slava. He says, Andy, somebody's here. They want to meet you. And I'm, OK. He said, hop in the car, and we drive to the outskirts of town to this uh, guest house. And I get introduced to a man uh, named Vitaly Mete. Uh, he had been a, a Soviet submarine commander. And as I learned from him, and then he became director of a factory in northeastern Kazakhstan at a place called Uskamenogorsk that produced low and rich uranium pellets for the nuclear power industry. And we had a good talk, and then that went on into a dinner. I got to know him as a person. And when it was time to say goodbye, he said, Andy, I hear you like to hunt. Why don't you come up north 
and go hunting with me. And this was just at the beginning of hunting season in October. And I said, sure. So I flew up a week or two later uh, to Uskmenogorsk and the Altai Mountains where Mongolia, China, Russia, and Kazakhstan all meet. We went up to their base camp. They have a, a banya. We ate dried fish, naked banya, sauna, a real bonding experience, beating each other with birch branches. Uh, and then we went hunting for elk and moose. Um, it was first snow of the year. And I got to know Vitaly pretty well. And, and we, really, we really got along, built a strong rapport. Um, when we got back from the base camp, and last night I stayed in town, and I made the mistake of giving him a quintessential American gift, a bottle of wild turkey bourbon. And um, as they do in that part of the world, he opened it and said, OK, let's drink it. But we bonded. Uh, the next day before my flight back to Almaty, I got uh, sort of a windshield tour of the factory uh, and then dropped off at the airport, went back to Almaty. And um, over a period of months, you know, our trust developed. I got to know him better. Um, and I made it clear that we had to know more details if they indeed had uranium uh, beyond the, the low enriched uh, pellets, if they had weapons usable uranium. So another snowy day, Sl Slava comes outside the embassy, pick me up, takes me off to uh, an apartment complex outside of town. There's a little office in the apartment where they're selling Soviet night vision goggles and scopes and sporterized Kalashnikovs for the for sportsmen, for hunters. And this uh, uh, former KGB border guard colonel, um, Colonel Korbater, says, Andy, let's take a walk. We go out into the courtyard. And we're walking in the snow. And he, he hands me a little piece of paper like this. He says, I have a message from Vitaly. And he passes me this piece of paper. And I open it up. And it says, U-235. 90%, 600 kilograms. And I gulped. I put the paper in my pocket, and we kept walking and talking. And then I reported that back to Washington. That's enough nuclear weapons for dozens of, enough highly enriched uranium for dozens of nuclear um, bombs. It was just kind of unimaginable that there would be that much um, highly enriched uranium, weapons usable uranium uh, at a factory in, in Kazakhstan. So again, over a period of, of weeks, months, I kept engaged with Vitaly and then tried to sort of bring it from the black market deal into more or less secret government channels. And President Nazarbayev, the first president of Kazakhstan, came to Washington. I was part of that trip. And we had a secret meeting in Blair House, uh, where he was staying across the street from the White House, where we put heads of state. And um, we said, we need to visit the site and verify what's there. And you know, can you arrange that? And he said, yes. And so in March, together with an expert from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Elwood Gift, we went up to Uskomenogorsk in a snowstorm. It was early March. It was a long winter that year uh, in an Antonov 12 turboprop plane. We took off. 10 minutes later, it landed. I said, why are we landing already? Well, they didn't have enough fuel to go all the way up to Uskomenogorsk. So we went to a military airfield and talked ourselves into a, a top off of fuel and then flew up to Uskomenogorsk. Toward the site, we get to this sort of warehouse type building. It's guarded by a militia woman with a 9 millimeter Makarov pistol. And they open the wooden doors, and there's kind of a metal door. And it has a, a very good padlock, like you'd see in an antique shop, about this big. And 
Vitaly asked for the key. They open it up, and we, it's a big room with, it's dark, and they, they turn on a couple of hanging light bulbs. And there's a plywood table about this high off the ground, and there are these stainless steel buckets spaced out all across this big table, apparently so they wouldn't uh, reach a critical mass. And so we, um, we took samples randomly, uh, weighed what was in a particular can to see if it matched the amount on the label. And indeed, it was 90% enriched uranium-235, much of it in the form of pure uranium metal. Um, and it's sort of banal. It's just gray metal. I picked it up, and it was heavy. And I was like, oh, yeah, duh. It's a heavy metal. <laughs> um, so after this visit, we took some samples with us, went back to the embassy in Almaty, briefed the ambassador, wrote a report back to Washington that indeed there was 600 kilograms of weapons usable uranium protected by a, a good padlock. And that, that got Washington's attention. Until we had had eyes on, there was a lot of skepticism. So that launched a, um, an operation between the Department of Defense and Department of Energy to uh, fly the material back to the United States. They sent a team over in C-5 uh, Galaxy aircraft. It was the longest flight they'd ever taken to this uh, remote, remote location in northeastern Kazakhstan. It took about six weeks to package the material, and we were very concerned. We had learned through sensitive intelligence that the Iranian, Iranian operatives <coughs> had been trying to purchase all kinds of materials and expertise for weapons of mass destruction, including for nuclear weapons, and had visited this factory. So we felt we were in a race against the Iranians. We were in a race against winter, because the planes wouldn't have been able to land in the winter. Um, and the material was all packaged uh, onto these uh, Soviet-era trucks at the factory at 3 o'clock in the morning. Very few people knew this, but we had a secure convoy from the factory to the airport. It was cold, mixed snow rain with black ice on the roads. These trucks were sliding around. I was the only American in the convoy. I was in the lead car. And I thought to myself, I don't want to have to report to Washington that one of the trucks slid off a bridge and is floating down the Irtish River. But they know how to drive in these conditions in that part of the world. And we, uh, <clears throat> we made it to the airport and then were met by the C-5 Galaxy, loaded it up. And they flew all the way back without landing, four aerial refuelings en route to Dover, Delaware, and then by, uh, by truck to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where the material was blended down for um, use in the power industry. The, um, this was a really unusual case, and it led to a, a series of sort of clean-out operations. At that time, over 50 countries had significant quantities of, of HEU and plutonium. Now it's about 20. So we made a lot of progress since this first example. But Vitaly really was key to making this happen. And individuals with guts like Vitaly make such a difference. The trust between our governments grew out of this joint secret operation. It was announced publicly when it was done, and the material was safely back in the United States. But we, we did manage to maintain, maintain secrecy because we thought that was the best security uh, we could have, that people didn't know what we were doing and, and what material was there. So based on this trust, the government approved our request to visit a biological weapons facility that we had learned about from defectors on the territory of Kazakhstan, just over the Russian border in a formerly secret city called Stepnogorsk. <clears throat> this facility was 200 meters long, 
and it had <clears throat> in the main fermentation hall all in biosafety level four high containment. The workers had space suits and, and breathable air hookups. It had 10 of these 20,000 liter four story fermenters. There was a, a bunker complex hardened to withstand a nuclear blast, supposedly, where they would have loaded the uh, biological weapons onto um, different kinds of munitions. The capacity of this plant was just, it can only be called evil. 300 metric tons of anthrax during a wartime mobilization period of about eight months. It's just unimaginable, the scale of this. Um, if you know something about anthrax, much less than a gram can kill uh, thousands of people. Um, so we worked with Kazakhstan to dis safely dismantle this facility. And if you were to go there today, thanks to uh, the Department of Defense and, and the government of Kazakhstan, you just see a, a green field. The Soviet Union's open air biological weapons test site was also in the Aral Sea on an island called Vazrajdenia Island or Renaissance Rebirth Island between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And there in 1988, the Soviet military had buried over 100 tons of anthrax. In, in 11 pits, and we took samples and determined that that material was indeed there. They had tested, in a single test, they'd have 80 to 100 monkeys spaced out on the test grid. Then they'd collect them after exposing them to biological weapons agent and bring them to a containment laboratory and observe the onset of death to determine the effectiveness of their biological weapons. This uh, lion of a man, uh, his name is Lev, Lev Sandakchev. He was director of a facility in Siberia in a formerly secret town called Kotsovo outside of Novosibirsk, where the Vector Virology Center is. That was a facility that developed smallpox, Marburg, Ebola as biological weapons. We had intelligence in 1997 that the Iranians had visited this facility and were seeking to get access to the variola virus that causes smallpox, to aerosol technologies that they had developed there, and to bring scientists from Vector to Tehran to teach them how to make biological weapons. And we. I got to know Lev the first time when he came on an Academy of Sciences visit to Washington. We bonded. Subsequently, that was in the summer of 1997. Subsequently, we got more intelligence about the Iranian efforts. And uh, together with my State Department colleague, by that time I had been assigned to the Pentagon, we decided that we couldn't just reveal our intelligence and issue a demarche to the foreign ministry in Moscow, they would, wouldn't pay attention to it. That the only way we could stop this would be to do it at the source. And we thought we had a good counterpart in Lev to make this happen. So I went and talked to my boss at the Pentagon. I said, um, I think we can, if we offer them support of scientific, peaceful scientific and medical research with US scientists, um, and some security upgrades to their WHO-approved smallpox repository, I think we can try to convince them to break off their ties to the Iranians. So I flew out there with a small team in uh, late fall of 1997, and again in the naked Banya with Lev. We bonded. I brought a little sweater for his dog. He loved his dog, Dunya. And, um, and then we had a really tough negotiation but at the end of a three-day period, without any approval from, from Moscow, he was a gutsy guy. He used to say, what can they do? I already live in Siberia. <laughs> we agreed. We, we, we signed an agreement that they would break off their ties to Iran. 
and work with us, and we would provide them $3 million of assistance for research and security and biosafety upgrades to their, to their laboratory facilities. And it worked. We, we were able to tell that indeed they broke off contact with Iran, and, and we had a very good engagement for about a decade with this facility. But it's because of the individual. So it's relationships and people like Lev that make these sorts of important things happen. Quickly, uh, Libya and Syria had big uh, chemical weapons caches. I started early in my career working against Gaddafi's chemical weapons programs and, and nuclear and, and biological programs. In 2014, after Gaddafi had fallen, or actually, um, I visited in 2014, this is February 2014, but it was after Gaddafi had fallen, um, Mustafa, one of the engineers, chemical engineers, um, had told us that there were 517 artillery shells filled with mustard gas and uh, eight of these large uh, gravity bombs uh, and, and a number of rockets uh, filled with chemical weapons agent. And so we did a project with Libya in the middle of the desert to destroy these uh, horrible chemical weapons before they fell into the hands of ISIS affiliates who were, were very active at the time. And there I, I got to visit to celebrate the destruction of the last artillery shells with the director general of the Nobel Prize winning Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, Ahmed uh, Azumchu, uh, who's, who's an advisor to our Council on Strategic Risks today. So people like Mustafa, we were flying back to Tripoli, helicopter to the airfield, fixed wing to Tripoli, and engineer Mustafa came up and said, Andy, I just want you to know that in the late 1980s, I was working on Colonel Gaddafi's chemical weapons programs, and today is the best day of my life to see the last one of them destroyed. So people like Vitaly, Lev, Mustafa, they make such a difference. Just real quickly, I also in my final Pentagon assignment serving as Assistant Secretary had oversight of the US deterrent, our nuclear deterrent, I believe strongly in a safe secure and effective deterrent, although there are some excesses and there are ways to reduce the danger of, of nuclear war. Today with Ukraine, there's a lot of talk about small nuclear weapons, low yield nuclear weapons. It sounds very vanilla and antiseptic. Well, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. That would be classified as a small nuclear weapon. It killed about 200,000 people and caused cancers for decades. In closing, here I am with a young senator from Illinois in 2005 in Kiev at one of the central health laboratories. Uh, where they worked on uh, endemic disease, including anthrax. Uh, they've been in the, in the news lately, these, the Ukraine bio labs, but we actually launched that program um, at that time in 2005 to consolidate and secure the dangerous pathogen collections. President Obama said in a speech that I attended we must not let the worst weapons of the 20th century darken the 21st century. I could have gone to Paris. Any questions that you might have for someone with Andy's wide range of experience, please submit them on the app.
thanks very much um, for discussing these experiences, Andy. One question I have um, is that is, is whether any particular decisions or actions stand out as having made the difference between securing um, these materials, so nuclear, uh, nuclear materials in the case of Project Sapphire, and uh, biological weapons in the case of uh, your work with the Vector Institute, and um, whether any particular um, decisions or actions that people took um, stood out as particularly crucial as making the difference between those possible outcomes. Yeah, the, these are prevention programs that I was involved in. They were set up by Senators Nunn and Luger in 1991 to deal with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you don't get credit for the catastrophe that doesn't happen. But that much uranium, if the Iranians or, had gotten their hands on it, they would have had a nuclear weapon uh, decades ago. If North Korea had gotten their hands on it, they would have had a nuclear weapon much earlier. So it, it made a big difference. It's hard to measure um, the success of these operations because the only metric that really matters is failure. Um, and then in the case of Vector, we had reporting that representatives from the Iranian WMD enterprise um, had been deliberately targeting Vector and other biological facilities in Russia for expertise. So it could have been that the United States, had we not offered an, an, um, an alternative, it could very well have been that um, Iran would have a, a robust biological weapons program today. Thanks for those examples where small teams have made a big difference in uh, the control of weapons of mass destruction. Um, I imagine something that's on many minds currently is how the invasion of Ukraine affects the future of arms control. Um, can you speak about how that affects what's important and also how it affects what's achievable today? So today in Ukraine, and, and I, I believe that this is the worst crisis of my lifetime, and I was too during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the possibility that Russia, as it fails militarily, if it continues to fail militarily, they lost a, a big ship, the Moskva, their flagship in the Black Sea this week, uh, that they will reach for weapons of mass destruction. And, and that would change the world uh, if they used a, a biological chemical or, God forbid, a, a nuclear weapon. So we need to do everything we can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, um, and when you say that this is, you know, the greatest crisis of your lifetime, um, uh, in in what sense is this the case? The, the Cuban Missile Crisis is, of course, known for being perhaps the most likely case of a, nu uh, a nuclear war um, happening. Um, is that the kind of outcome that you're thinking about, or are there a sort of other specific measures of how bad this is? Yes. Yeah, so the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was no shooting going on. That's what's different about today. So the, the possibility of accidental escalation through miscalculation is very worrisome. But also, this movement towards low yield, battlefield, small tactical nuclear weapons, I think increases the likelihood of them being used as a tool of war. Uh, they, they shouldn't be. They should be used only as a strategic deterrent. Um, Reagan and Gorbachev said a nuclear war can, can never be won and must never be fought. But the Russian doctrine allows for what's called escalation, escalate to de-escalate. That would, if the existence of the Russian state is threatened and the way Putin has defined Ukraine I think they do see this as an existential um, threat. So if he, um, if he employs this doctrine, which we've seen exercised over the last decade, of using one or two small nuclear weapons in the hope that Ukraine would, would sue for peace, NATO would back off, and everything would calm down, I think that's a, a very um, real possibility. and the, the hope that it wouldn't escalate into a broader nuclear exchange, I think, is um, just a hope. Right. 
Um, this concept of escalate, de-escalate, it seems like, at least in public com communications, um, it seems like it's very controversial whether this is in fact uh, something that Russian decision makers seriously can, like, take seriously as an idea. Um, what is your view on whether, you know, how likely it is, is this is in fact, and like what evidence is there for and against this being in fact uh, part of Russian doctrine? Yeah, I, I think we have pretty strong evidence that this is their doctrine, um, mostly from the exercises that they've had um, over the last decade, but also from their writings. That's how we first learned about it, was from very senior Russian generals writing about this and from their national security um, strategies. So uh, there was some question about whether this was um, indeed the doctrine, but look at the threats that Putin has made. In a sense, he is following this doctrine, so that's the most uh, compelling proof that indeed that is their doctrine. The sort of brinksmanship uh, on, uh, yeah, with public communications, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, on TV, he, he directed an increase in the nuclear alert and basically threatened NATO to stay out. Right, so many of the things we've been discussing thus far are um, issues that are reasonably well known. And so I was interested to see that the forecasting platform Metaculus published a report uh, on the 24th of March, so right at the beginning of the invasion, saying that their top forecasters typically thought it was less than 1% likely that a nuclear weapon would be used in Ukraine this year, so in 2022. Um, do you disagree substantially with that assessment? Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, a lot of nuclear experts uh, say that it's a remote possibility. Um, I don't think it's a remote possibility. I, I'd give it about a, I hate to put a number on it, um, but if the war continues to go badly for Russia, I would say it's, it's up to a 20 or 25% chance that he would use a nuclear weapon. I think it's even more likely that he would use chemical weapons or biological weapons. Right. So many of the, because many of the things we've discussed are fairly common knowledge, and so, for example, this group of forecasters is likely to be aware of them, are there things which you think that even people who think reasonably carefully about this kind of thing are just entirely missing or like not really not very well understood by um, people who are thinking about this? Yeah, I, I think part of it is we, we have no data, right? There were two nuclear weapons ever used. Um, and so there's no data. So a lot of it, this is, is theoretical. But I think there's a bias to hope and think that, oh my God, these weapons are so terrible that nobody would ever uh, authorize their use in war. But I'm afraid in the last 10 years especially, um, we've, we've drifted from a point where the sole purpose of nuclear weapons was to deter nuclear war to this blurring between conventional and nuclear and emphasis on low yield, small dual use delivery systems and incorporating them into our exercises. And even the United States has started to react to Putin's policy by also emphasizing these smaller theater nuclear weapons in its planning. And I think it's very dangerous. And, and I think we'll see what happens in the next few weeks and months. But we need to change the direction of that and start to eliminate these most uh, dangerous most likely to be used types of nuclear weapons. Makes sense. So many people in this audience will, be, will want to know how they can enter this space and how they can make a difference. So um, one thing I'd be very interested to know is that, is suppose that in a decade or so, someone from this audience is uh, making a significant difference, or may, perhaps doing some of the most important work in arms control. What might that be? And how might they have gone from where they are now to that? It's been amazing. So the Council on Strategic Risks has had a, a biosecurity program for the last few years and a fellowship. And, and it's been amazing to see how much dynamism and new thinking uh, the, the, this community, you, have, have brought 
into the field, and I, I'd like to see the same happen in, in the nuclear security field, where we don't have a very good pipeline. Um, we don't have experts coming in. Now, mostly, these are weapons that are controlled by governments, and so the most important thing would be to work within or work from outside on influencing the governments that have nuclear weapons. In the case of the United States or the UK, I think it would be uh, very important to try to get some direct government experience or work in the, in the nuclear weapons establishment, as well as think tanks that work on these issues. That's the most likely way we can make progress, though, would be to have people, a whole sort of new generation who, who understand um, the importance of preventing nuclear war and, and restarting arms control in a way that reduces the risk of nuclear war. Right. Um, finally, before we move on to uh, Q&A for everyone's questions from the audience, um, it would be good to hear briefly about concretely how, this, uh, how your fellowships actually work, so both on the biological side and then the fellowship that you're setting up on the nuclear side. Great. Well, first I'd like to say thank you to Longview Philanthropy which is starting a nuclear effort. <clears throat> and we at CSR are just thrilled to be the first grantee. And that will allow us to start a fellowship to start building, rebuilding this pipeline of expertise that we need in arms control, nuclear weapons. Um, as we've started to do on biosecurity, we will um, begin advertising for this fellowship. Uh, we'll keep it very small in the, in the bio fellowship. It's called the Ending Bioweapons Fellowship. We, we're <clears throat> finishing up our second year. We had five amazing fellows the first year, some of whom are here. We had, uh, have five in the current cohort that, that is on the, almost finished with, with the program, uh, one of whom is here. Sergeant Nicolette Chamato from the U.S. Marine Corps is one of our ending bioweapons fellows. And so we want to replicate that success with, in, in the field of nuclear security. I'll just give an example. So we have uh, one of our first cohort of, of biosecurity fellows was Steph Guerra. She was doing, overseeing cancer uh, research for the Veterans Administration and decided to pivot into biosecurity and use her, her scientific expertise. She did the fellowship with CSR, uh, actually came to work for CSR after the fellowship, and now she's working in the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and she helped write the American Pandemic Prevention Plan that was released a couple months ago. So she's right in the middle of this it's, it's, it's amazing, but just an incredible example of what's possible. We need people to move in and out of government, um, and think tanks are able to actually loan people to the government for a period of two or three years. And it's great for them, because then they get experience, they get the security clearances, and, and we, we are starting to rebuild the field of biosecurity, which um, w had been pretty neglected in recent decades. Great. So now we have some great questions from our audience. First question, how do we create more effective dialogue with countries like China about bioweapons or nuclear non-proliferation? It's so necessary. Um, what we need to do, because we've been unable at the government to government level to have engagement on these issues with China, that's called track one. But then there are track two discussions where you have think tanks um, meeting with their counterparts, China, Chinese, Americans, other countries, to discuss nuclear weapons issues, to feed ideas that could then be adopted by the governments. And then there's a hybrid called track 1.5 where you have a mix of non-government people, former government people like me, retired government people, um, as well as um, active, active government people. 
And that's where you can have a freer dialogue. It's not like a, a formal negotiation or meeting where, where each country reads from a script. You can brainstorm and come up with ideas. And I think it's very important with China. We've had this history with Russia on nuclear weapons going back uh, since the 1970s, actually. We know each other. Um, it's very difficult right now, but those lines of communication are still open. But we haven't been successful in engaging China on, on nuclear arms control. We've got to do it, and that's one of the things that CSR is, is going to be implementing with this new um, support from Longview. Great. So another question is, as technology evolves, how do you predict nuclear deterrence changing in the next decade or two? It gets more and more and more complicated. Um, the decision times are getting shorter. Um, the ability to, to be stealthy and get around early warning systems. Um, artificial intelligence, if it is used in nuclear command and control to deal with the fast decision times, um, I don't have to tell anybody here about the, the risks of that. Um, there are just so many new technologies that are, are being uh, weaponized by different militaries around the world that complicate the situation. Um, so the challenges get harder and harder uh, every year. Relatedly, we have a question, uh, has arms control gotten more difficult or less difficult over the last few decades? It's gotten much more difficult. Um, and I'm afraid this current uh, situation, uh, arms control with Russia is gonna suffer. We had started a dialogue. President Biden in his second week in office extended the new START treaty with Russia another five years, but that is now um, suspended. It's probably going to take a change in the political leadership in Russia to be able to have a constructive arms control agenda, but we need to lay the groundwork now to have the ideas fleshed out, the verification mechanisms fleshed out, and then we'll be ready when the political opportunity comes similar to what happened when, when Gorbachev became Secretary General of the, of the Communist Party of Russia. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done that we need to be doing now to prepare for, for future arms control, to be innovative. And, and we think that the focus should be on these smaller nuclear weapons that are most likely to cause war, and also on ambiguous systems like cruise missiles like the calibers uh, that Russia's using almost every day in Ukraine with conventional warheads, they can also carry a nuclear warhead. And that is just a recipe for miscalculation. So we need to, for example, one idea we have, we call it cruise control, where no country would be allowed to put nuclear weapons on cruise missiles, sea-launched, air-launched, or ground-launched. And those are the kinds of ideas that we, and we need new ideas and we need new people. Yeah. Uh, any tips for learning how to build the sorts of high trust relationships with individuals from geopolitical adversaries that proved so critical in your disarmament and non-proliferation success in the past? Uh, consistency, get to know them time and time again, and then get to know them as people. I mean, I brought Lev a, a sweater for his dog because I knew how much he loved his dog. Um, it's the dinners, it's the time outside of the formal meetings that you develop those human relationships. And that, that's my one takeaway from my, my privileged career is that relationships are everything. It's nothing you don't know. <laughs> You've spent the last couple of days in one-on-one -on -one meetings building relationships. So you do this already, but that's the key. Thanks. So on quite a different topic, how do you reconcile maintaining credible nuclear deterrence with trying to lower the risk of a nuclear war? So uh, I support stable deterrence. I think uh, long-range ballistic missiles, submarine-based, land-based, they can't be launched without warning. They have a big signature when they're launched. They only carry nuclear weapons. 
I think we can have more stable deterrence until eventually we can get rid of all nuclear weapons. But first, let's get rid of these smaller, ambiguous, dual-purpose weapons, which are most likely to be used. And there's another element of this. Um, I don't want Putin to think that if he uses a small nuclear weapon, that our response will be proportionate, that all he risks is a small nuclear weapon back. I think that weakens and undermines deterrence that we have these small nuclear weapons. A particular technology someone's asking about is how concerned are you about hemp use, so high altitude electromagnetic pulse? Is a use likely given the current doctrine of low yield nukes? I'm not that worried about it. There have been some, some novels written about this and a lot of people are very concerned about it. It would be a nuclear attack. So if China or somebody would, were to use that type of nuclear weapon, it would be the same as a nuclear attack. On the connection between um, one kind of nuclear conflict and another, um, to what extent, uh, so two questions here. So one is, given your pessimism about some things at the moment, to what extent is nuclear war inevitable in the 2000s? And a second question, how will US-China tensions trigger Russian nuclear or foreign policy interventions? Could you repeat the last part of that? So how will US-China tensions trigger Russian nuclear and foreign policy intervention? How do these two things mm. interact with each other? Well, first of all, we can't have any use of nuclear weapons. We've made it over 75 years with zero use of nuclear weapons. And we need to maintain that. Because I'm afraid the day any nuclear weapon is used that the world just changes in a flash. It changes everything. So we need to avoid that. We need to avoid the legitimization of using nuclear weapons in war. The, the China-Russia relationship is interesting. What would Putin's use of a nuclear weapon in Ukraine do to the China-Russia relationship? I think it would probably uh, lead to a, a tension between China and Russia if Putin were to go nuclear. Right. Um, and in terms of uh, another question about uh, different actors having potentially different, um, different, take, different reactions to the same situation, what is the likelihood that the Russian establishment, so generals, people in the nuclear chain of command, would follow through on an essentially suicidal decision by Putin to uh, carry out a nuclear first strike? That's where their training would kick in. They would do it. Nuclear weapons, um, the National Command Authority in the United States and Russia, it's one person. And the military commander are trained to follow the orders. Um, I don't see uh, a possibility that they would, um, would not. Okay. Um, and something that is on a few people's minds at the moment is what can the EA community do to help prevent nuclear escalation in the current conflict? This is one of those moments in history, like the breakup of the Soviet Union that I lived through. It's, it's just, it's a tectonic shift. And, and I think there's so many different ways. I, I shudder to call it opportunities, but to get involved in different aspects of this conflict, whether it's dealing with the refugees, whether it's finding ways to counter Russian domestic propaganda and lies about this war so the Russian people understand what's actually happening. And then if, if a nuclear weapon is used, there will be, this happens in history, after a breakdown, then there, usually it's followed by an effort to, 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 to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, so be involved, get, get, find ways to get involved, whether it's writing op-eds or, or researching, um, talking to people, uh, 
I, I just think there are so many elements of this current disaster and there are therefore so many opportunities to get involved and, and help reduce the suffering and hopefully uh, be able to build something better uh, in the long term uh, after it's over. Right. And you've mentioned a few times that the risk of Russia using weapons of mass destruction increases if the war keeps going badly from a Russian perspective. What do you see as a good, good outcome from this conflict then, given that the war going well for Russia would be bad in other ways, or the war going badly for Russia would be bad in other ways? I don't see any good outcome for anybody. Um, it's just uh, the methods of warfare targeting civilian soft targets, uh, it's just horrific. Um, so we need to find some kind of, of ceasefire uh, we need to keep supporting Ukraine's efforts to defend themselves and strengthen, um, strengthen NATO and the unity of NATO, but I don't see any good outcomes. There is no good outcome from war. And on a very related note, how do you, uh, fi final question, um, how, how do you sustain mentally working on existential risks and global catastrophic risks for years. So I'm an optimist. <laughs> I wouldn't be in this business if I weren't an optimist. And, and I gave you a few examples today of, of tractable problems. These are tractable problems. We can make bioweapons obsolete by having a better system of early warning and rapid medical countermeasures to the point where our adversaries will realize that pursuing Biological weapons, won't, they won't be effective as a weapon of mass destruction. These are tractable issues. You have to break them up into bite-sized chunks sometimes. The example of the Syrian chemical weapons stockpile, they had 1,300 tons of chemical weapons agents. And when we started working on this problem at the Pentagon in 2011, when the first civil unrest was happening, it, it just seemed impossible. That sounds like an ocean of chemical weapons. But I asked our experts to do the math. And the question was, how many trucks would it take to move 1,300 tons of serious chemical weapons stockpile? And they came back, and we had great intelligence on the Syrian uh, chemical weapons stockpile, uh, exquisite intelligence. There's a great book called Redline by Joby Warwick that has details about this. And the answer was about 200 trucks. And all of a sudden you can think about it as, as a realistic possibility. And it was split among about 10 sites and different sites might become accessible at different times. So maybe it's uh, 20 trucks at a time, 20 truckloads at a time. And thinking about it that way, it made it possible. And indeed, when in 2013, the United States and France threatened the use of nuclear, or of, um, <laughs> not nuclear, <laughs> of military force against Syria, we were able to, to reach a deal. Uh, and indeed, the Syrians drove those chemical weapons to the port where they were loaded onto Danish ships. And it took about 200 truckloads and they were all destroyed uh, on, a, on a U.S. reserve naval vessel uh, in the Mediterranean with a, a neutralization plant in an environmentally safe way under OPCW supervision. People thought that was impossible, but we started planning. We actually had a secret dialogue with Russia over the course of a year. We had six meetings in Europe where we actually focused on what would it take, what would you need to destroy the Syrian chemical weapons stockpile. So when the deal became possible, we were ready to go. And indeed, nobody thought we could destroy that amount of chemical weapons in, in such a short time frame. We had given ourselves a deadline in the, in the Kerry Lavrov agreement, and we met it. We exceeded it. Thank you. Andy and his colleague, Andrea Rosanico, will be available um, basically here. Um, to talk about their work and opportunities at the Council on Strategic Risks. Uh, Andrea, would you mind standing so people can find you afterwards? Great.
Great. Thanks for being here, and thank you, Andy, for sharing all of this with us. Oh, thank you, Kip. Thank you.